Hi Darcy, Hare Krishna. Oh, I didn't have ever anyone else's mic on. That was really selfish of me, wasn't it? <laughs> Can you hear me, Bucky? I hear you now. Yes, I had I had your oh. mic turned off. Yes, I can hear you. Hare Krishna. I'm I'm turning my mic back on. I can control I it, so don't worry. <laughs> so it doesn't look like Candida is coming, Darcy, so you may be it again. All right, I'm it again. I'm the it. <laughs> That's okay. Can you hear me okay? I hear I don't you. Have my I don't have my big mic attached. I hear you just fine. Okay, perfect. Better, better than usual for some reason. Oh, that's weird. I mean, that's cool, but that's weird. So, shall we start? We text 24, is that yes, correct? Yes, that's, that's where we're at, yes. Okay. Uh, text 24. Achedyo yam adahyo yam. Akledyo Shosha Evacha Nitya Sarva Gata Stanur Achalo Yam Sanatanaha. Translation This individual soul is unbreakable and insoluble and can be neither burned nor dried. He is everlasting, present everywhere, unchangeable, immovable, and eternally the same. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. All these qualifications of the atomic soul definitely prove that the individual soul <clears throat> is eternally the atomic particle of the spirit whole, and he remains the same atom eternally, without change. The theory of monism is very difficult to apply in this case, because the individual soul is never expected to become one homogeneously. After liberation from material contamination, the atomic soul may prefer to remain as a spiritual spark in the effulgent rays of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But the intelligent souls enter into the spiritual planets to associate with the Personality of Godhead. Hi, Candida. <clears throat> the word Sarvagata, all-pervading, is significant because there is no doubt that living entities are all over God's creation. They live on the land, in the water, in the air, within the earth, and even within fire. The belief that they are sterilized in fire is not acceptable because it is clearly stated here that the soul cannot be burned by fire. Therefore, there is no doubt that there are living entities also in the sun planet with suitable bodies to live there. If the sun globe is uninhabited, then the word Sarvagata, living everywhere, becomes meaningless. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are you ready? What, I need to just uh, look up the verse. Um, We're on text we on? chapter 2, text 25. Okay, um, go, go ahead for this, this verse, and I'll 
catch you on the next one. All right. Okay. Text Thank 25. You. Avyakto yam echintyo yam avikaryo yam uchate tasmad evam viditvainam nam nanu shochim sochitum arhasi. Translation. It is said that the soul is invisible, inconceivable, and immutable. Knowing this, you should not grieve for the body. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. As, previously, as described previously, the magnitude of the soul is so small for our material calculation that he cannot be seen even by the most powerful microscope. Therefore, he is invisible. As far as the soul's existence is concerned, no one can establish this existence experimentally beyond the proof of Shruti or Vedic wisdom. We have to accept this truth because there is no other source of understanding the existence of the soul, although it is in fact, although it is a fact by perception. I think that's a great line right there. This, this is one of the ones, Dossie, I wanted to talk to you about this one. And in one that we read later, he says, you just have to believe Krishna. And that's what he's saying here, too. So we can't intellectualize it. We can't prove it. We simply have to just accept what Krishna says. I remember you mentioned this verse, or this yes. line in the purport. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to underline it. No one can deny the existence of his father based upon the authority of his mother. There is no source of understanding the, the identity of the father except by the authority of the mother. Similarly, there is no source of understanding the soul except by studying the Vedas. In other words, the soul is inconceivable by human experimental knowledge. The soul is consciousness and conscious. That, is, that also is the statement of the Vedas, and we have to accept that. Unlike the bodily changes, there is no change in the soul. As eternally unchangeable, the soul remains atomic in comparison to the infinite supreme soul. The supreme soul is infinite, and the atomic soul is infinitesimal. Therefore, the individual soul, being unchangeable, can never become equal to the infinite soul, or the supreme personality of Godhead. This concept is repeated in the Vedas in different ways, just to confirm the stability of the conception of the soul. Of the soul. Repetition of something is necessary in order that we understand the matter thoroughly, without error. Next verse. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to make a comment, though. Can I? Um, of course. Help? Yes. But, um, let's see. Uh, Prabhupada was saying that we just have to accept what is said in the Vedas. Um, but he gives and, us one caveat, perception. Yes. Okay, I need to read that. I have to come back to that. Because um, I got in to a big argument with a philosophy professor in college. Uh, we were discussing um, proof of God, the existence of God. And um, uh, anyway, he, he was really uh, challenging all of us. But, uh, you know, like let's say if we did not accept the Bible or a religion or a religious text. And um, I finally came up with the proof, proof of the pudding is the eating, like what Prabhupada said. Um, we can, just like, um, you can't really explain what love is, but those that have experienced it know it. They know what it is when they experience it. So um, we can't prove to anybody else that uh, God exists. But, you know, like by experimental experiments, um, empiric knowledge. But no one can take away our personal experience with him. And so it doesn't matter what, uh, whether other people believe it or not. I don't know. I'm just kind of really rambled that out just now. Um, I'll express it better later. I think that's fine. Time. Okay, text 26. 
Atha chainam nitya jatam nityam va manyase mitam tatapi mahabaho nainam sho chitum arhasi. <coughs> Translation by Srila Prabhupada. If, however, you think that the soul or the symptoms of life is always born and dies forever, you still have no reason to lament, O mighty armed. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. There is always a class of philosophers, almost akin to the Buddhists, who do not believe in the separate existence of the soul beyond the body. When Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita, it appears that such philosophers existed, and they were known as Lokayatikas and Vebashikas. Such philosophers maintain that life symptoms take place at a certain mature condition of material combination. The modern material scientists and materialist philosophers also think similarly. According to them, the body is a combination of physical elements, and at a certain stage the life symptoms develop by interaction of the physical and chemical elements. The science of anthropology is based on this philosophy. Currently, many pseudo-religions, now becoming fashionable in America, are also adhering to this philosophy, as well as to the nihilistic, non-devotional Buddhist sects. <clears throat> Even if Arjuna did not believe in the existence of the soul, as in the Vebashika philosophy, there would still have been no cause for lamentation. No one laments the loss of a certain bulk of chemicals and stops to charge, discharging his prescribed duty. On the other hand, in modern science and scientific warfare, so many tons of chemicals are wasted for achieving victory over the enemy. According to the Vebashika philosophy, the so-called soul or atma vanishes along with the deterioration of the body. So in any so in any case, whether Arjuna accepted the Vedic conclusion that there is an atomic soul, or he did not believe in the existence of the soul, he had no reason to lament. According to this theory, since there are so many living entities generating out of matter every moment, and so many of them are being vanquished every moment, there is no need to grieve for such incidents. If there were no rebirth for the soul, Arjuna had no reason to be afraid of being affected by sinful reactions due to his killing his grandfather and teacher. But at the same time, Krishna sarcastically addressed Arjuna as Mahabahu, mighty armed, because he, at least, did not accept the theory of the Vebashikas, which leaves aside the Vedic wisdom. As a Kshatriya, Arjuna belonged to the Vedic culture, and it behooved him to continue to follow its principles. I have a comment on this one. I think if the body is temporary, there's greater cause for lamentation because it's gone forever. So I, I don't see, uh, I mean, I think I started life and still have this, this philosophy underlying my thinking all of the time, this Vebashikas, because that's really modern concept. But I do think that I don't think that's cause for no lamentation. I think it's cause for more la lamentation, because when you die, you're done, and death is a painful experience. So I I think it's very lamentable. So, well, can I say something to sure. that? Sure. Yes. Um, when one is experiencing a higher taste and developing love for Krishna, I think that. It's um, easier to not be affected by knowing that everything is temporary um, because you're knowing you're knowing that this isn't permanent and why why get attached whereas uh, Krishna and spiritual life is permanent and it's eternal. So as one makes spiritual advancement, one does not feel, uh, I mean, one, of course, uh, we will feel lamentation. And, um, you know, when somebody dies, someone that, 
we love is close to us, but um, it, we should know that it's it's different and it's a temporary phase and that person will take another birth and hopefully if they've come in contact with Krishna consciousness, it, for sure it'll be a much better and higher birth. I think I agree with you that if you experience a higher taste, but you can't stay in that state all of the time. If I were in Prabhupada's presence, I don't think I would have any fear of death. He overpowers that. But normally that's not my, my state of mind. And I don't think that I can stay in that level of Krishna consciousness. And I've never been able to get there on my own with any amount of chanting Hare Krishna, with any amount of reading, nothing. So even though you may say if you experience a higher taste, if you're not in the midst of that higher taste, you're just back in your body. <laughs> so I, I think that while, while I agree with what you're saying, I don't think that's a simple thing to do at all. Oh, it's not. So it's, it's, what, not. So it's not that it's not, it doesn't give that much relief then. By gradual practice um, that this de that we develop um, definitely, and it's also we get our strength from Krishna. We it doesn't come from us anyway. We're not we don't have the power. You know we're not um, we're dependent on the Supreme Lord for us to be uplifted and. Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, it, it's uh, a, a lifetime of practice. Um, and then gradually, gradually, uh, as we make spiritual advancement, it should become easier. So I really agree with you on that. It's not an instant thing. So we're on... Could I comment, please? Please do. I've, I didn't want to ask you, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, this is all very important, what Kandita and you were talking about, but this is not what he's talking about in this purport. So, in the previous verse, he was talking about the presence of a spiritual entity within the body. And he he's saying that these two groups, the Lokayatikas and the Vaibhashikas, they believe that the um, the it's just an interaction of chemicals, that there is no um, living entity in there. It's just an interaction of chemicals, and that there's no lamentation for that because they use all these chemicals in wars. They use all these chemicals for all these other things. So what's the big deal if it's just a collection of chemicals? So, well, I don't think to... I don't think they say it's just a collection of chemicals. It's a collection of chemicals that, at a certain point, has become a conscious entity. It's all I think it's always yes. the conscious entity, even as chemicals that we worry about. Okay, in his purport, he says the body is a combination of physical elements, and at a certain stage, the life symptoms develop by interaction of the physical and chemical elements. So he's it's still not, they still don't um, see it as the living entity within a body, which is what we see and what you are discussing. They're, they're not there. That's not what they're thinking. That's not how, they're, how they see oh, well, the then that I don't think that's modern science then. Modern science yeah. doesn't deny the existence of consciousness, nor does it say... Yeah. You, you no, know, he's it, talking about these two groups, the Lokayatikas yes. and the Vaibhashikas. He's talking about those two groups. He's this is a so the the Bhagavad Gita is a logical, um, philosophical tome that goes step by step by step, and so this is one step. And he's, um, Kandita says, atheistic scientists say that. Yeah, so he's. He's um, cutting down each each one of these things in the purport. In the purports, he's he's saying this is this just can't be true. And if it is true, then 
Arjuna has no reason to lament because it's just a combination of chemicals and chemical reactions. He shouldn't, he shouldn't lament. So if, if that's, that's all you see it as, but I, 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 right. I didn't get but, that from his purport because he said it's very much like the thinking of modern science. And, and I don't think science says we're not conscious. I know, but we have to follow what Prabhupada's argument is because it's a it's step by step a logical argument argument through the purports. So instead of instead of going off on what we think, we need to just look at what he says about um, the physical body just being chemical elements. We know that's not true, but this is part of the foundation of his argument within this. Uh, this is the summary and he'll get into it further on with each chapter. But we need to just look at it, um, look at each piece of this puzzle that he's presenting to us, and not and try not to go off on other things. Just stick with this one thing. And Kandita says it is and always has been, of course. But we need to stick with what Prabhupada's saying in the purport so that we can understand the larger the larger world of, of argumentation or philosophy about the existence of the soul, the existence of God. We know what the conclusions are because we're devotees, but we need to look at what he's saying here and go and watch his progression, his philosophical progression of the argument. But you have to look at each argument along the way. I mean, I, I, dis, I totally agree with you that he's making a foundational uh, argument about or, or discussion. But I also think that there's plenty of room to then talk about what he's saying and put it and look at it in different contexts. So anyway, the next uh, we're on. What are we on? 20, 27, 27. OK. Jatasya hi druvo mrityur druvam jan ma mrityasya cha tasmad apar tasmad apari har yur te natvam sho chitum ar hasi Translation by Srila Prabhupada One who has taken his birth is sure to die and after death one is sure to take birth again. Therefore, in the unavoidable discharge of your duty, you should not lament. Purport by Srila Prabhupada One has to take birth according to one's activities of life, and after finishing one term of activities, one has to die to take birth for the next. In this way, one is going through one cycle of birth and death after another without liberation. This cycle of birth and death does not, however, support unnecessary murder, slaughter, and war. But at the same time, violence and war are inevitable factors in human society for keeping law and order. The Battle of Kurukshetra, being the will of the Supreme, was an inevitable event, and to fight for the right cause is the duty of a Kshatriya. Why should he be afraid of or aggrieved at the death of his relatives since he was discharging his proper duty? He did not deserve to break he did not deserve to break the law, thereby becoming subjected to the reactions of sinful acts of which he was so afraid. By avoiding the discharge of his proper duty, he would not be able to stop the death of his relatives, and he would be degraded due to his selection of the wrong path of action. Jai. Next Text, verse. Thank you. Text 28. Abhyaktadini Bhutani Vyakta Madhyani Bharata Abhyakta Nidhan Yeva Tatra Ka Paridevana Translation by Srila Prabhupada. All creating beings are unmanifest in their beginning, manifest in their interim state, and unmanifest again when annihilated. So what need is there for lamentation? Purport by Srila Prabhupada. 
Accepting that there are two classes of philosophers, one believing in the existence of the soul and the other not believing in the existence of the soul, there is no cause for lamentation in either case. Non-believers in the existence of the soul are called atheists by followers of Vedic wisdom. Yet even if, for argument's sake, we accept this atheistic theory, there is still no cause for lamentation. Apart from the separate existence of the soul, the material elements remain unmanifested before creation. From this subtle state of non-manifestation comes manifestation, just as from ether, air is generated, from air, fire is generated, from fire, water is generated, and from water, earth becomes manifested. From the earth, many varieties of manifestations take place. Take, for example, a big skyscraper manifested upon the earth. When it is dismantled, the manifestation becomes again unmanifested and remains as atoms in the ultimate stage. The law of conservation of energy remains, but in course of time, things are manifested and unmanifested. That is the difference. Then what cause is there for lamentation, either in the stage of manifestation or in unmanifestation? Somehow or other, even in the unmanifested stage, things are not lost. Both at the beginning and at the end, all elements remain unmanifested, and only in the middle are they manifested, and this does not make any real material difference. And if we accept the Vedic conclusion as stated in the Bhagavad Gita, that these material bodies are perishable in due course of time, antavanta ime deha, but that the soul is eternal, nityas yokta sarena, then we must remember always that the body is like a dress. Therefore, why lament the changing of a dress? The material body has no factual existence in relation to the eternal soul. It is something like a dream. In a dream, we may think of flying in the sky or sitting on a chariot as a king. But when we wake up, we see that we are neither in the sky nor seated on the chariot. The Vedic wisdom encourages self-realization on the basis of the non-existence of the material body. Therefore, in either case, whether one believes in the existence of the soul or one does not believe in the existence of the soul, there is no cause for lamentation for loss of the body. Text 29. Okay, and this will be the last one then, okay? Okay. Okay. Ascharya vat pasyati kaschid inam Ascharya vat vadati tatai vachanyaha Ascharya vat chainam anya srinoti Shrutva yenam vedana chai vakaschit Translation by Srila Prabhupada some look on the soul as amazing, some describe him as amazing, and some hear of him as amazing, while others, even after hearing about him, cannot understand him at all. Purport by Srila Prabhupada Since Gita Upanishad is largely based on the principles of the Upanishads, it is not surprising to also find this passage in the Katha Upanishad. Sarvanath Sarvanayapi bahubir yo na labya Shrinvanto pi bahavya yan na vidyu Ascharya vakcha kusalo sha labda Askarya sha jnata kushala nushistaha the fact that the atomic soul is within the body of a gigantic animal, in the body of a gigantic banyan tree, and also in the microbic germs, millions and billions of which occupy only an inch of space, is certainly very amazing. Men with a poor fund of knowledge and men who are not austere cannot understand the wonders of the individual atomic spark of spirit, even though it is explained by the greatest authority of knowledge, who imparted lessons even to Brahma, the first living being in the universe. Owing to a gross material conception of things, 
Most men in this age cannot imagine how such a small particle can become both so great and so small. So men look at the soul proper, proper as wonderful, either by constitution or by description. Illusioned by the material energy, people are so engrossed in subject matters for sense gratification that they have very little time to understand the question of self-understanding, even though it is a fact that without this self-understanding, all activities result in ultimate defeat in the struggle for existence. Perhaps they have no idea that one must think of the soul and thus make a solution to the material miseries. Some people who are inclined to hear about the soul may be attending lectures in good association, but sometimes, owing to ignorance, they are misguided by acceptance of the supersoul and the atomic soul as one without distinction of magnitude. It is very difficult to find a man who perfectly understands the position of the supersoul, the atomic soul, their respective functions and relationships, and all other major and minor details. And it is still more difficult to find a man who has actually derived full benefit from knowledge of the soul and who is able to describe the position of the soul in different aspects. But if, somehow or other, one is able to understand the subject matter of the soul, then one's life is successful. The easiest process for understanding the subject matter of self however, is to accept the statements of the Bhagavad Gita spoken by the greatest authority, Lord Krishna, without being deviated by other theories. But it also requires a great deal of penance and sacrifice, either in this life or in previous ones, before one is able to accept Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna can, however, be known as such by the causeless mercy of the pure devotee and by no other way. Jai Prabhupada, that's a good place to stop, don't you think? Absolutely. That's that's the purport of the whole thing right there. Yep, yep, I agree. Yep. Thank you so much, Bhakti. Thank you. Uh, I 